first thing I want to apologise for is we're not, I'm, I'm sorry we're not as broad shouldered as a. Uh, <laughs> you know, we try and work out, but when we landed in America, the food here and the portions have just been too much for us. <laughs> diminished in size since we got here because the food is enormous. And actually, every time we told people we were coming to Texas, they all said, oh, save some room in your stomach. Because they know that once we get to the Texas State Fair, we're going to have to eat some alligator. <laughs> some deep fried lemonade. We did our best. <laughs> we, did, we, we did our best, but we couldn't, quite, we couldn't quite handle it. But whatever you do, please, no one tell my mother I ate deep fried alligator or deep fried beer. I don't think she knows that. I don't think she knows I'm giving up the diet so quickly. The other thing I want to say, just quickly, is I had the opportunity to debate with one of your debaters today. Um, he was in his first year, and it was an absolute honour and privilege to see him give such an outstanding speech in today's debate for a room of his compatriots. And you know, I, I just want to say uh, thank you very much for allowing me to do that. the reason I do debate in the first place. Tonight. Mm -hmm. okay, time to bring the rain. Okay, so they tell us <laughs> they, they, they have this real problem in today's debate. They have a very simplistic analysis of power and discourse and how it works in societies, particularly during elections. Because they think that there is a way you can equalise the amount of influence that people have in a particular discursive space, in other words, during an election cycle. And the problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that is simply impossible. We did our very best to show that by saying people with the most money have the most power, A, is not true. We're going to give you the evidence to demonstrate that. Actually, the person with the most money is not necessarily the corporation. But even if it was true, some mad crazy land where we ignore statistics and evidence, even if it was true, taking out money simply shifts the influence to a different group of actors, whether it's the media or whether it's particular um, like political ideologies that use different campaign tactics, it's always going to be influenced in your political system. The question you have to ask yourself before you leave the room in today's debate is who brings you the most just system? Do not be fooled by the idea that money equals bad, because it doesn't. I'm going to talk to you about the kinds of organisations that spend money and do it for perfectly legitimate political reasons. That's today's case from the opposition bench. Okay. Firstly, they tell us, well, corporations can fund things without people knowing about it under the status quo. Firstly, that's not true. A simple watch of the West Wing tells you that the campaign that accepts corporate donations have to reveal those corporate donations to all people during the election process and afterwards. That's how I know the percentage of, the percentage of corporate donations Barack Obama accepted in the 2008 election. Secondly, even if that's not true, and Aaron Sorkin lied to me, which is perfectly plausible, um, they need to show you this debate is not about disclosure requirements. Right? Because we could do that without affirming or denying the motion. Actually, the debate is about power, it's about how money affects political elections, so they don't win on that point, even if, they, even if you believe that they're right, which they're not. Recognise that <laughs> they told us that we don't have a counter proposal. We could have presented you with lots and lots of counter proposals. We could, for example, tell you about the Clean Money Programme, where every money that's donated by people, every, every dollar that's donated by a person, is matched by state funding. Or we could tell you about the Patriot Money Programme, devised by two Harvard economists who give each American $200 of credit that they can use during any election cycle and ban corporate spending anyway. That's an alternative, but we don't have to do that. We just have to show you the world that they support is one that is demonstrably worse than the world that we bring you in the status quo. That's going to be really easy. They also talk to you about lobbying. They said, well, lobbying occurs out all the time. It's really problematic, and, but with this policy, they can withdraw the amount of power that lobbies have in America. So they say the NRA, the National Rifle Association, <laughs> Threatens John McCain and says, if you don't support this particular policy and let guns go on campus, then we won't pay for you. We won't give you any money in the next election cycle. Yes, that's one way that they exercise power. But recognize that there are others, right? They can also mobilize lots of congressmen to not vote for that particular person or support these particular bills. And those things still happen. All that happens now is agreements are made, but you never, ever get to hear about it. Because politicians will always be beholden to the kinds of organisations that can mean that they lose political power. All that happens now is you don't know that the NRA gave John McCain $2 million. You don't know that the, that, the, that the corporations support this politician, which means you never get to hear about that policy position until it's far too late. That's really troubling as far as I'm concerned. Then they said, well, I mean, look, at the end of the day, we make life better. It's not enough for the British to just say, that, to just come up here and just talk nonsense. But then gave you three different... Three concrete reasons that life is worse. He told you that you give more power to the media, like people like Fox News become the main proponents of political messages. You no longer get about Obama knocking on the doorstep and talking to someone in New Hampshire because he hasn't got the money to go there anymore because you've capped the amount of spending he can use. And you also get disenfranchised people. 
Why would any politician spend money on a particular group of people who aren't going to vote, right? The main thing about the Obama campaign is his ability to mobilize young individuals of different racial and ethnic backgrounds who have never, ever voted before in their life. It is not a coincidence that Obama, A, raised the most money any politician in your country's history has ever raised, and B, got more votes from particular demographics who have never voted before in their lives. That's why we've been today. Okay, presidential leadership is about consensus. This is my first constructive argument. Recognize that the role of the president is incredibly difficult. The separation of powers means that they have to be in a position to negotiate with Congress, and it means that they need to be able to show that they need to be more than just a nice guy. They need some kind of mandate. One of the important democratic ways you can do that is by going around the country and talking to different interest groups and being able to negotiate with them about policy positions. When the NRA backs McCain, you know what his policy on gun control is. When Obama is supported by the abortion lobby, you know what his position on abortion is. That's what's important. Under their system, without these donations in the public, politicians can avoid the difficult questions about difficult policies, and you never get to find out what their answers are to the most difficult questions. My second piece of constructive is about freedom of expression. Recognize that it is impossible to eliminate uneven influence in any democratic election. Some people just have more access to resources than others, but also recognize that using free media, like social media, only gives you access to one particular demographic. At the end of the day, my grandmother has never used Facebook, and when you prevent Obama's ability to knock on doors and talk to her, you unfairly prejudice that particular group of people from having any kind of contribution in that society and its political process. And I think that's really unfair. I'm not just saying this to be, to be you know, British and social. I mean, I really mean to <laughs> Because it is fundamental to people's ability to express themselves that that expression has some kind of concrete benefit. It's not just about saying, I have the right to free speech, but I have the right to influence other people's opinions about what kind of society we live in, what kind of America we're going to have. And when you limit their ability to do that, the abortion lobby or whether it's Coca-Cola, that is fundamentally unfair. And we think that for that reason, you should oppose today's debate. Thank you. They will. The difference is, you can't have the disclosure requirements that you would love to have. Because now everything goes on in secret. Because it goes on in back doors. Because I've reached my campaign limit, but okay. I still need money from corporations. But That's the difference. You want to get to hear what people do. The McCain Bible Act also, also says things about disclosure and make sure the corporations disclose. How is this not an affirmative argument? The, right. The McCain Feingold Act talks about disclosure. That's excellent. The problem is it also caps political spending. That means that the kind of influence that these companies will get, and different lobby groups, remember it's not just Coca-Cola, we're talking about interest groups, which are collections of American people. Sure, I, I know what interest opinions. groups are. That's... Recognize they'll always leverage power over politicians, okay. no matter what. That's, that's an interesting point. Uh, you mentioned several suggestions, you know, what could be done. What, we at least offer something that would solve some of the problem. What do you do about it? Here's one. So all donations to political parties could go into a, an unknown fund held by the FEC, the Federal Electoral Commission. Every American person gets $200 to spend on any political campaign they like, and it goes towards that politician. Uh, where does that $200 come from for well, every individual? I mean, the cost so it would of come freedom through is, taxes. is unlimited, right? It would come through taxes if necessary. Okay, so if it comes through taxes, uh, how do you think the current Congress 
uh, would feel about raising taxes, giving our fans a deficit. Never with my political knowledge, but actually, uh, Obama was the first candidate in, to ever turn down state funded support for his presidential election. State already fund people for, pol for political Wh Which is a completely different policy than the one that you just said was your proposal, well, it's, correct? It's, it's the same money, it's just used differently, right? It's money that okay. is given to people who let's, want to be president. Let's, let's talk about this $200. This $200 through your proposal, not a cap on political spending? Well, sorry, we're not defending the Patriots. You said you don't have any such proposal. I said there are lots of other options. I just we're asked what you were defending. You said, that, you said that you were defending that, and then you can't tell me why no, that's not. I never said we were defending that. I simply said the world as it is is better than your world, and if there are other worlds that are still better than your world, even if you can't get That's, that's so a very straightforward argument. Okay. <laughs> very concise. All right. Thank you.